Thank you, Poland United Methodist Church, for going above and beyond for all the kiddos at Akron Children's Hospital. The blankets, sheets, toys, and uh, decorations will definitely bring smiles to the kids and their families. And Andrew was very excited to hand deliver everything to all of his friends. Thank you again for all of your support. What a great way to start the service, isn't it? Um, what, a, what a real blessing. I, I, too, would like to thank the church, just as Andrew did, uh, for all the donations that you saw there, uh, even the monetary donations. Though I know a number of people uh, gave financially as well uh, that will go to buy things. Uh, so thank you, thank you so very, very much uh, for being a part of that. Uh, I would like to continue by welcoming all of us uh, here in our uh, worship center, uh, in the sanctuary, all of those that are in our parking lot, I'd like to welcome you, and then all of those that are watching online. Uh, it's just a great opportunity to come together to worship God, to feel His presence no matter where we are, and to know that He is always here with us. As we uh, continue in our, our, our service, I, I would like to, uh, to make mention of some of the ministries that we have going on. Uh, if, if we are here uh, in, in the church, in our uh, back uh, foyer, Narthex, is uh, Kitty Madison. She's setting up. She has uh, materials for summer camp uh, and then for our vacation Bible school, which is July 19th through the 23rd. Um, and so we have a, a number of needs. You can see that uh, on our, our page or also contact uh, Kitty or contact the church office. Uh, that is uh, just a great opportunity and a lot of fun, both the summer camp and the vacation Bible school. Those are, those are great, great events, and, and people are doing just a great job with that. Um, and so as we saw with Andrew, uh, with our... Uh, the mission that we had with Acre Children's, we actually are starting a new monthly mission. Uh, this, it's the Beatitude House. And uh, as you can see, this is uh, for disadvantaged women and children. And there are a slew of things that we are uh, asking people to donate with. They also have a website uh, uh, with a... Um, it's a wonderful website. They have a video on there. It's about seven and a half minutes long, so it's a little too long for us to, to play right now, but I really encourage people to go. This is a wonderful organization, and if you could go on their site and see that, that would be fantastic, and we can continue. Um, also today, the uh, Sojourners are having an e event at uh, Flambeau's Restaurant. I wasn't sure exactly where that is. I drove down Market Street. It's just off to the side. Uh, it, it has a sign on it. You can, you can find it there. It's just take out uh, uh, spaghetti dinners. Sojourners uh, to the past uh, uh, is, is headed by Penny Wells, who's been uh, coming to church here uh, with that. And it's a youth event, and this helps the youth as they raise funds uh, for that. So uh, if, if you would like to be a part of that, that would be a great thing to, uh, to help out with. Uh, and then the last thing that I'd, I'd like to do is just to thank everyone. We had a, a, a busy week this week. Uh, we had all those that worked at the chicken dinner, and they, they do a great job each month, and I'd like to thank them. We also had quite a crew that came out yesterday uh, for our outside work day. So uh, if you haven't, you know, those of us here on the way out, look, if, if you're in there, come and look, because you know the way weeds are, they grow immediately. So by tomorrow, it may not look as, as good as it does today. So get out. It looks really, really nice. Everyone did a fantastic job. So thank you so very much for coming and for uh, uh, being a part of that and for us moving together with that. At this time, uh, what I would like to do is to invite our kids uh, to come down and uh, join us down front, and we will have our children's moment. 
Hi. Hey. How you doing, Lily? Hi, Hunter. That's a nice big brother, thanks. <clears throat> Did you make it? Big step. You can do it. There you go. All right. Well, good. How are you guys doing? I'll get down here like this. How about that? She said good too? All right. All right. Good. Oop, was there? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, well, today, downstairs, they're going to be talking about a fellow by the name of the Apostle Paul. He was a really good guy in the church, but you know what? He didn't always start off that way. He did some bad things early on. Have you guys ever done anything bad? I have. Yeah, because we're not perfect, huh? Sometimes we do things bad. Sometimes we have to say we're sorry when we do when it's bad, huh? But you know what? Even when we do something bad, God loves us so much, he always forgives us. Did you know that? He does. And that there's a, a word that they use. It's a big churchy word called grace. But they, basically what that means is, is God is always going to forgive us no matter what. So even though he wants us to try to do good all the time, he's going to love us even when we make mistakes. Huh? Isn't that nice? Because Paul knew that too because he made some really big mistakes. Yeah, you could see yourself. Yeah. Yeah, your hair looks nice up there too, doesn't it? Uh-huh, it does. That looks really nice. So, okay, how about if we say a little prayer and then we can go down, okay? Let's bow our heads. We'll say a little prayer. Dear God, we thank you so very, very much for always loving us. You love us and you hope us whenever we're good, and you love us even when we, when we make mistakes. And help us to know that you will always love us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. You guys can head down. <laughs> yeah. That's fun. All right. <laughs> That's always fun, isn't it? I, 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 I just really, really just love that. Today we, we are having communion and our opening song really leads us into that. The opening song is entitled Surrender. Now today is the first day that uh, we have made, as, as everyone here will recognize, uh, masks are optional for people. Um, we try to let people know that this is kind of a no judgment zone uh, in a sense. If people wear masks, if they don't wear masks, that's okay. It doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter to us. Um, none of those things should. We encourage people to do as they feel led. We want everyone to feel safe. We know some people uh, are, are very uh, immune sensitive. I, I have a relative of mine um, who basically, uh, because of medical reasons, can't even get the COVID shot. Uh, they can't get flu shots or any other kind of shots. They just uh, are unable to do so. And so everywhere that she goes, she has to be masked uh, and, and to go. Uh, but, you know, we never know anyone's backstory with that. Uh, and, you know, as humans, it's easy to judge, but that's, let's not do that, especially in the church. So we want this to be open and, and, and freeing. So what we're going to do, uh, what I'm going to invite people to do, I know with singing, um, we like to stand if we can. We haven't been standing at all for our song, so I'd like to encourage people, if you feel led and able, uh, stand during the song uh, Surrender uh, as this is moving us forward. Uh, now, if you're sitting in your cars, you may want to step out if you're going to stand, okay? So I, I get that. Uh, if you're at home, depending on where you are, but uh, I want all of us to, uh, to be able to do and to worship God as we feel that we can worship God. That's what it's really all about.
So may we now listen to the words, sing the words if you know them, uh, and may we stand and join together in the song Surrender. I'm giving you my heart and all that is within. Lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving you my dreams, laying down my rights. I'm giving up my pride for the promise of you. may be seated. Those words really are meaningful, especially leading us into communion, that we do surrender all to Christ. We surrender ourselves, our ways, our thoughts, anything about us, and we give that over to God. We're, of course, reminded on the night of what we refer to as the Last Supper, the disciples did not realize that at the time. They went to that small upper room in the city of Jerusalem with Jesus. We're certain they probably went every year that they were together. We know Jesus went when he was 12 with his family. Every faithful Jew, if they lived within a region, were to go, was to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. That was a, a meaningful, meaningful time. So this was the only time recorded in the scripture that he went, but it was probably every year that he had gone. And he was in that small upper room. And it's, the scripture tells us that he had shared together in the Passover meal. After which, the scripture says they had reclined. They were probably sitting as they customarily would have done on, on kind of like large pillows on the ground. And on the tables that they would have had before them. They would have had chalices with, with wine that they would have taken symbolic drinks and unleavened bread and the entire, what we would refer to today as the Seder meal. But then it says that he had done something that he had never done before. He had taken some of the unleavened bread. He had laid his hand upon it and he had blessed it and then broke it to them. Then it says, likewise, after which he took a chalice and filling it with wine, laid his hand upon it, set a blessing over it, and passed it amongst to them. 
may we know that Jesus' body and blood was broken for us and for our sins. That's why we are surrendering all, as the song just said, because of what he has done for us out of his great love. May we bow our heads in a moment of prayer. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you so very, very much for these acts that you have done for us. And we pray this blessing over these elements that we have now before us. That this wafer and this cup, Lord, truly symbolizes your body and blood broken for us but more so, your tremendous love and your grace and your forgiveness for our sins. So, Lord, we give these out before you. And we truly accept all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For those of us here, if we have these... I, I, I know we've had people with difficulties, but if we could take the top layer off with the wafer. This now is the body of Christ. Just remember what Jesus would have done in that small upper room with the disciples. They did not understand. They did not know. But we know the full impact of what that means. We know how he suffered and died upon the cross and how he gave his body for us. This is the body of Christ that he broke for us. May we take and feast on him in our hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen. And now the blood that he shed for us and for our sins is before us. May we take and drink in remembrance of this, his holy act of grace. May we bow in prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you so very, very much for allowing us allowing us to repent and to admit our imperfections and to know that you have not only died for those that we have repented of, but you have died and forgiven even those that we have not even realized that we have committed. And for this, we are truly thankful and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture that I will be speaking from briefly this morning is taken from the gospel according to St. Mark. In the third chapter, verses 20 through 30, let us listen to these words from Mark. Then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. 
He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Have you ever read an obituary? In my profession, I've obviously read quite a few. Yet, I have never read an obituary that has said, you know, when this fellow was alive, his family thought he was absolutely nuts. I've, I've, I've never read that in one. Now, my kids might write that about me, and there would be some legitimacy, of course, to that. Uh, but you typically don't see that written, even if it were the case, right? Even if people might be thinking it, you don't see that in print. But our passage opens up with Jesus and his disciples gathered for a meal. Yet they were unable to eat because the massive crowds that were coming in oftentimes was the case around Jesus. But then it goes on to say... Some of Jesus' family goes to take charge of him, saying, he's out of his mind. Really? His own family is saying this, and it's in print. He's out of his mind. You see, even some of Jesus' own family didn't believe in him. And then in addition to all that, it goes on to say the teachers of the law said that Jesus was possessed by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. So he had both some of his family and the religious leaders saying, all you're doing is evil. Not exactly the ringing endorsement one would expect when talking about the Son of God, right? He had done nothing wrong and yet that's what some of his family and teachers of the law were saying. But you see, this is actually one of the things I enjoy about Scripture because it doesn't ever try to gloss over the truth. It doesn't say, oh, everybody loved them. You know, it's kind of like you've heard people say, oh, yeah, back then things were perfect. It's like, no, things were never perfect. And the Scripture doesn't pretend like they were. No. He had some of his family and the teachers of the law saying he was possessed by the devil. So you see, our challenge is to figure out then what this message is conveying to us and make it applicable within our lives. Now let's face it. There were people then who had some weird ideas about Jesus, and there are people today who have some weird ideas about Jesus. That is true, unfortunately, in every time period. So let's look at some of the things that they were saying and, more importantly, Jesus' response. The people were saying that Jesus was not only crazy, but his powers were coming from Satan. His response, he begins by pointing out the irony of this concept. For Jesus had driven out evil, and specifically Satan, from both people and situations. Okay? And we have known that in Scripture. They even knew that. So Jesus goes on to say, how would Satan drive out Satan? You see, it, it, it makes no sense. It is not logical. I mean, that would be like saying heat can drive out heat. Heat cannot drive out heat. It makes things hotter, but it doesn't drive out heat. Cold can drive out heat, but heat does not drive out heat. And evil cannot drive out evil. Only the love of God can drive out evil. So it begins by talking about the irony of it. It's not logical. And then you see, this is where Jesus goes on to say the words that many people quote, much of which is quoted out of context. He says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. Now, I'm sure most people have heard that quote used before. But in its proper context, do we really understand the full message 
of what he was saying here. You see, we need to understand and to realize and to think of the kingdom as the kingdom of God and the house as the location where the family of God resides, okay? The kingdom of God and the family of God. You see, unfortunately, people use this quote to just point out any differences two people may have with one another or situations may have. They'll say, oh, that's a, that's a house divided. That's taking it out of context. Heck, that was even said about my parents years ago, that they had a house divided. Because, you see, when they started dating in the 1940s, my father was English and my mother was 100% Italian. Oh, that's divided. You weren't, you weren't supposed to do that. And then even bringing it up a little bit more recent with Becky and I, I mean, here I am, a United Methodist minister, and I'm about to marry some Irish Catholic? Ooh, that's going to make a house divided. No. You see, people have used that for years. They've used that with with African Americans and white Republicans and Democrats, uh, management and union. I mean, the list can go on and on and on, right? Of how we have misappropriated that phrase, a house divided or a kingdom divided, because that's not what it means at all. Now, let's think about this for a moment, logically and from the words of Jesus. What is the one thing that every member of the family of God, remember this is the house, the family of God, is supposed to emulate within God's kingdom both on heaven and on earth? It's not to be like any of these other things. It has nothing to do with race or position or any of those things. The answer is love. That's the one thing we are all called to emulate, love. Now, how do we know this? Well, first, Scripture tells us that God is love. Not that God likes love, kind of approves of love. God's very essence, God is love. Now, specifically in our passage, when they talk about driving out evil, only the love of God could drive out Satan. So it was the very essence of Jesus' love that drove out Satan or evil in general. Okay, so let's get practical. What does that tell us? It tells us that any time that we are not united in love, we are dividing. And we are separating ourselves from one another, and we are separating ourselves from God. That's when a house becomes divided, when we are not loving. Not that we are different. We're all different. We're all different. That's not what unites us. The one thing that unites us is love. His kingdom, his house is built upon love. Everything we think, every word we speak, every action we take needs to be based upon the love of God. And when this does not occur, we're causing division. So anytime we're not loving, we're part of the problem. Whenever we're loving, we're part of the solution. Jesus was always loving. Even when some of the family and and some of the teachers said not, Jesus was still part of the solution, not because of what others were saying. You're always going to have the haters, as they say, But the bottom line is, we are still called to love. We are still called to love. A kingdom or a house divided by not always loving cannot stand. And love for God and all of God's children is really not an option. It's really not. We can't say, well, you know, if it divides, it divides. It's really not an option. As I said earlier, God is love. 
So, by not loving, we are going directly against God's very nature. Whenever we aren't loving, we are going against the very nature of God. Not simply something God might disagree with, but something directly in conflict with God's very essence. That's why it says this is a blaspheme against God's Holy Spirit. It's really talking about us being unloving. That's the blaspheme. Because God is love. So not loving is an attack against God's soul. That's a big deal. That's not really optional, at least in my mind. And I'll be frank, having been a pastor for 41 years, probably the most difficult virtue I have personally encountered with myself and encountered in dealing with others is being loving. It is difficult. Oh, I can be loving toward family and friends and people in general, but let's face it, there are some people we all have a difficult time finding anything we even like about that person, let alone loving them. Now, we might say, oh, no, I don't have anybody like that. Oh, yeah, we all like to say that. But the truth is, there's people out there we have a hard time even liking, let alone loving. It's hard. We need to just give that up to God to say, God, you got to work with me on this. That's like people saying, oh, well, I love that person. When was the last time you talked to him? Oh, I think it was like 1962. It's like, no, that doesn't count. You see, it's hard to be loving. It is. It's hard. But if we're going to be united with Jesus, and that's what he's calling us to be, because we don't want to be a part of the house divided. And by not loving, we are being a part of the house divided. We need to choose love. And if we're going to be united together, we all must love. That doesn't mean we're all going to agree. That'll never happen. That will never happen. And we shouldn't even work toward that. We should be loving and accepting even when we disagree. That's the key. But you see, Jesus leaves that choice up to us. He gives us that free will. He's hoping that we will love. I'm hoping that I will love. I would like to think you are too, all of us. So my recommendation is to choose love. It's not easy. I just admitted that. But it's always worth it, isn't it? Isn't it always worth it? So let's work together and be loving and unify the kingdom of God. May we bow in prayer. Gracious Lord, I I thank you so very, very much for loving us. And Lord, I know personally how much you love me, and I also know personally how much I, I really don't deserve your love on many, many days. But you love me in spite of me. Lord, help me to do the same. Help me to love everyone in spite of themselves. And help them to love me in spite of me. Lord, help us to work together to unify your kingdom both on earth as we would like to do and will be in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing song is Psalm 62. And for those in our sanctuary uh, and for those closing, I invite you to stand and for the rest to truly listen to these words and to be inspired as they touch our souls. Rest in God alone, my rock and my 
salvation, a fortress strong against my fault, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me, I'll fix my heart on righteousness. I'll look to Him who hears me. As we prepare to depart this place and go back into that dark, dark world, we're reminded that we are one. We are one because of Jesus. Jesus who came and died and rose again. And now it's our obligation to allow that light to shine in a world that is dark so that others might find their way to the one and only God of love. Good peace. Amen.